Good morning. Let's all stand and turn to song number 55 to get us going. Number 55, we'll sing when we all get to heaven. Let's sing first, second, and last on 55. traveling and it's good to have a pretty good crowd here this morning and again hope you enjoy the, the message here in just a little bit before that let's go to 45 here for our next song number 45 we'll sing there is power in the blood first second and last on this one 45 
l'adoration. Let's go to 97 for our next song, number 97, and let's sing I Am Bound for the Promised Land. Why don't we sing all of them here on 97?
feeling good this morning. Before we get our last song and leading into the message, I've got a card uh, given to me to read from our preacher and preacher's wife. And the card reads, God bless you with the same peace, hope, and love that you bring to the lives of others. And she writes, there's no words that express our thanks to you during this time, but know how much we appreciate all of you. Thanks so much for the prayers, the cards, the visits, the food. Continue to pray as Preacher heals up. God bless you all, Preacher and Judy, she writes. Keep praying for them. You know they appreciate it, uh, and you know it matters uh, to them that you keep praying for them. And it is good to have him back in here for the two or three, t third time here in a row. So uh, that's good. Let's go to 313 for our last song here before the message. And number 313, we'll sing What a Friend, and we'll sing them all on 313. <laughs>
Amen. Thank you, Levita. Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 11 this morning. John chapter 11, and while you're turning there, I'll say a quick thank you of my own uh, to all you all. I appreciate the uh, kind words of, of gratitude and of encouragement. It means quite a bit to me. I, I truly do appreciate that. John chapter 11 here this morning. And we're going to look at one verse here, and then we're going to move out of John for a little bit, but we'll come back, so maybe leave a mark in John chapter 11. And the verse we're going to look at here to start us out is verse 35, and it's a quick one. It says, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. John chapter 11, verse 35 is a powerful verse. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible but it is, uh, carries with it a depth of meaning that we can uh, gather from, uh, from those two words. This verse is part of, a, of the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. And that's, of course, uh, you get to this, this point in, in the story, and Jesus, uh, He weeps, He expresses sorrow over the pain, of, uh, the pain that the death of His friend has caused those around Him. It shows us the compassionate and an empathetic nature of our Lord and Savior. Jesus, He is deeply moved by the suffering of those around Him, and He weeps. And yet Jesus is going to go on to perform an incredible miracle in raising His friend from the dead. There are several uh, kind of themes that we can draw from the fact that Jesus wept. And we'll run through them real quick here, then we'll go kind of... Uh, cover some a couple other things then we'll come back to this kind of outline here but some of the things we can draw from the fact that Jesus wept number one we see the love of Jesus in his tears the fact that Jesus wept at the scene of the death of his friend shows the depth of his love it's a reminder that Jesus loves us number two we see the compassion and humanity of Jesus Jesus' tears show us that He is not a distant God. Uh, he is not a God that uh, is, is separated from us, uh, it, but it, He is very much in, t in touch with, his, uh, or with our human thoughts and our human feelings. He can feel the things that, that we felt. Number three, we see the power of Jesus in His weeping. Despite His sorrow, Jesus doesn't stop at weeping. He goes on to perform one of his, his most dramatic miracles that He performed while He walked this earth in the resurrection of Lazarus. And we'll look at more of that uh, later as well. And then number four, the fact that Jesus wept shows us or gives us hope that we have in Jesus. His weeping gives us hope. It shows us that it's, first of all, okay to grieve. It's okay to cry. It's okay to shed a tear. It's okay to, to feel pain. But with Jesus, those feelings are only temporary. And He'll prove that to us here uh, in just a bit. So before we get into that kind of outline, I first wanted to look at some other instances in the Bible of others that are weeping, that wept. And these instances show that weeping is a natural human response to certain things. It's a variety of situations can cause us to weep, to cry. We uh, could experience grief, maybe disappointment, maybe compassion, maybe happiness. Uh, a lot of things can, can cause us to cry, many different reasons of why we might weep. So let's look at a few of those here this morning. First, go to Genesis and chapter 21. Genesis and chapter 21. Here we find Hagar. She wept because she thought her son Ishmael was about to die. Notice verse, uh, verse 16 of Genesis and chapter 21. It says in verse 16, And she went and set her down with, over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. Hagar thought, her son was going to die. And so she cries. Of course, you know the story. Hagar and Ishmael, they had been cast out. They were uh, kind of the illegitimate son, if you will, of Abraham and cast out. And they were sent 
uh, with some provisions to basically go and, and try to survive out in, in the desert. And here we find that the provisions were spent and the, and, and the, the boy, Ishmael, was sick. And so here's a mother in tears. A mother with seemingly no hope of, of a better outcome than the death of her son. But yet, look at verse 17 in Genesis 21. It says, And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Hagar is there, and she thinks this is it. Her son is going to die. And then there's a voice. And the voice says, I've heard the voice of the lad. God sends an angel to go and to comfort her. And then look at verse 18 and 19. It says, Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad to drink. Not only does God send an angel... He promises to make a great nation out of this boy, this son, and then immediately gives her water. Sometimes we weep when we feel like there's no hope left, don't we? We feel that way, but in reality, we're not opening our eyes to what God can do in our life. Sometimes we weep when we really have no need to weep, and God has to go and kind of open our eyes to what's going on and then yes we realize oh there's the well of water that was right there just needed to open our eyes to it go to genesis in chapter 27 another example here we find esau and esau is going to weep when he finds out that his brother jacob had stolen his birthright or his blessing verse uh, or genesis 27 look at verse 38 here it says, And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice, and he wept. So again, Esau finds out that, uh, of course, he was in order. He was you know, due the birthright and so on. But finds out Jacob had uh, stolen this, this birthright. In fact, let's go and kind of see the backstory a little bit on this one. Go to... Go back just to chapter to verse six of the same uh, chapter, and we'll read six on down a few verses. Verse six of chapter twenty-seven says, "And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat, and bless thee there before, bless thee before the Lord, uh, before my death." Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. In verse 9, go now to the flock and fetch me from that thence two good kids of the goats, and I'll make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. So again, Isaac was going to bless Esau, but Rebekah, Jacob's mother, was having none of it. And so she conspires to trick Isaac into blessing Jacob and not Esau. And that's what took place, as we saw in verse 38. So what was Esau's reaction? Let's go back and catch a few verses before 38 on down, uh, getting to 38. Look at verse 34. It says, And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtly and had taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And then you see 38. Uh, Esau kind of comes to reality here, accepts the reality of the situation, and he cries. Esau bemoans a missed opportunity here, a pretty big opportunity. We, we understand, of course, the line that we're going here in Genesis from Isaac on forward, and we'll see some more of that line here, here next. But he, be, he bemoans a missed opportunity uh, of inheriting the ultimate privilege in this birthright. But why? 
Why was he bemoaning this misopportunity? I asked that question uh, because notice uh, uh, in chapter 25 what happened here before all of this kind of uh, trickiness took place. In, in verse 25, notice here verse, or excuse me, chapter 25, verse 30. It says, And Esau said unto Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, that thou that with that same red pottage, for I am faint, therefore his name is called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and, swear, and he swear unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob, and Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. He had previously, Esau had already previously given up his birthright. He gave up the birthright for a morsel of meat and now he is weeping over losing it. You know, so often we bemoan these things that come our way. And we talked in the Sunday school lesson of being sure you're, willing to God, you're, you're in the will of God uh, because we know we're going to suffer, but let's not make it uh, because of our own doing. Let's do our best to stay in the will of God we're going to suffer because of the world, uh, but we, we uh, do well to not make it our own fault uh, as best we can in this. We bemoan things that seem to go wrong in our life, but we hardly ever stop in the mirror and think, why is this happening? Or what have I done, maybe, to cause this, uh, this atrocity or this, uh, this struggle or maybe it's something even smaller than that? What have I done to bring this upon myself? We might blame others. We might even blame God for the things that happened to us that we don't really like uh, in, in this. And so Esau wept because he felt sorry for his previous choices. And that can happen to us. We can weep, uh, we can cry because of some choices that we've made and now we kind of face the consequences for those choices in our life. Let's go to Genesis chapter 37. A couple more to look through. in uh, uh, why a human might weep. Genesis chapter 37, here we find Jacob in the scene here once more, but uh, we'll focus a little bit on Jacob and on Joseph here. Verse or Chapter 37, look at verse 35 of Genesis. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted, and he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. What's going on here? Jacob wept for his son Joseph who he thought, was told, and believed uh, to be dead. And of course, you know the story. Jacob, he favored Joseph more than the other sons, and the sons despised Joseph for it. So they first throw him in a pit, and then they sell him into slavery to a caravan that's headed down to Egypt. And of course, then the brothers had to come up with an explanation of where Joseph was, and so uh, they spread the, uh, the, the uh, blood of, an, of a beast on the coat of many colors, they give it uh, to his father and they tell him that a beast has killed, has killed Joseph. And Jacob, uh, the father here, his reaction is one that we would probably all have. He cried. He wept over uh, thinking that his son was dead. You know, death always seems so final to us, doesn't it? Especially when it first happens uh, in, in, to someone that we care about, someone around us. Death always seems so final when... When someone dies, we just feel an emptiness, don't we? And, and that's uh, certainly valid. Uh, you know, we, we selfishly, and, and I don't mean that necessarily too negative, uh, but we selfishly, we just want that person that we care about to be with us. feels final, uh, does death. But thank God, death is not final, is it? For the Christian, we talked about this was it last week or the week before, for the Christian, uh, it, death is the beginning of a new life. And it's the beginning of a new life in paradise, a place that uh, we can only just kind of just barely think about how perfect and great that this place is going to be. Uh, and it's a place we can all go if we make uh, the right choice in accepting the Lord for our salvation in this. And we can go and we can see those loved ones that have passed on and we will be with them forever. So here, Jacob, again, had no reason to believe that anything other uh, than what his sons had told him about what happened to Joseph uh, was true. And so he was dejected. In fact, you see at the end of verse 35, he was in a depressive state. It says, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. J uh, Jacob was depressed over the son that he 
favored among or above uh, all of the rest. But here we find uh, something so encouraging to you and I. Go to Genesis in chapter 50. Joseph, being sold into slavery, and we won't go through the whole story, but a few things certainly happened uh, in his life, and it winds up, uh, he winds up in a much better place than uh, being even with his father and his brethren. Uh, and not just for him, a better place for his entire family. And just real quick, you see in verse 20 of Genesis in chapter 50, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. We can look at difficult circumstances. We can look at major events that... Uh, that rock us in our, in our life, we can become dejected or we can look at why God is allowing these things to happen. And I'm by no means saying we can't feel sad when someone passes on uh, from, uh, from, this, from this life, uh, but we can look at when hardships come our way and we can be despondent. We may be, if we're not careful, go into a depressive state, uh, but we might, uh, we might want to think, why is this happening? Why did God allow this to happen? Why is this the timing of what God allowed to happen? Even in death, there is joy to be had. Uh, and that's, uh, that's something that as Christians, only Christians can say that uh, in, in this world. Uh, in this, we, uh, There's joy to be had when we know our fellow Christians are in a, in a much better place. And we can also trust that God is in control. We can trust that God means all for good in our life. Uh, it's hard to see sometimes, especially uh, in the first bit of these things. You look at Joseph, and I'm not criticizing, excuse me, Jacob, not criticizing him. He was despondent. He was depressed in this, uh, but wasn't seeing the big picture. Wasn't seeing why, or wasn't asking why God was allowing these things to happen. So, we see, uh, we see a few reasons of why we might cry. We see Hagar uh, cried because she wasn't opening her eyes to what was going on. We see Esau cried because he was bemoaning some previous actions that he had taken. We see Joseph uh, crying because he thought he lost uh, someone. We, death is so final to us, and yet uh, he finally sees the big picture in this. Now let's go to 1 Samuel in chapter 20, and then we'll get back into, into uh, John chapter 11. But let's go to 1 Samuel in chapter 20. We've kind of tilted towards the negative uh, in why we might weep in our life. Here's something uh, maybe a little more positive here for the most part. We find here David and Jonathan. Uh, they are uh, about to leave one another. Well, let's read, let's read 1 Samuel uh, chapter 20. Look at verse 41 and 42. Verse 41 says, And as soon as the lad was gone, David arose out of a place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times. And they kissed one another and wept one with another until David exceeded. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much as ye have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Joseph went into, or Jonathan, excuse me, went into the city. David and Jonathan, they are weeping here together as they are about to part ways. And this is an interesting story, uh, really, the, the, the kind of chapter uh, 20 and 21, and all, all kind of together. Uh, you'll see uh, David and Jonathan, the best of friends. And they're the best of friends despite the fact that Jonathan's father, King Saul, was uh, considered David a mortal enemy of his. Of course, he was the rightful heir, or not even heir, the rightful appointee, anointed to the crown uh, in this. And yet David and Jonathan had a very close bond. And things had gotten so troublesome for David. Of course, Saul was seeking his life uh, in this. And so uh, it was time for these two men to depart. And David was, was going to leave the city. It's an unfortunate circumstance that that truly at this point in time couldn't be avoided. And in fact, we see these men coming together only one more time. And, and we won't go there, but in chapter 23, and that was even in secret. It's a sad thing uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to leave loved ones. It's sad when things don't work out like we want uh, them to in our life. And these separ the separation here of these two faithful friends was hard on them. And so they cry. In David's case, he had to flee uh, for his safety, he had to leave a lot of friends and family and, and, and allies 
They went with a few and he uh, fled out into wilderness, cave, uh, whatever it might be. And so David, he weeps. Difficult circumstances in life often cause us to weep. But that's okay, isn't it? Uh, I want to make sure we're not saying here uh, that it's not ever okay to cry. Again, the first three examples we've kind of pointed out uh, where maybe we shouldn't be thinking about crying uh, because uh, we, we've made some mistakes or we've made choices or we're not thinking clearly, whatever it might be. Here we find two friends that have to separate. But they cry because they loved each other so very much. You know, it's, it's again, not wrong to cry. It's cathartic often to, to cry. We should thank God that we have the ability uh, to, to have emotions so strong that warrant shed tears. Thank God that we as humans can feel that type of emotion. Again, it does us a lot of good often. Uh, it's kind of that cathartic uh, feeling and uh, shedding those tears and, and kind of letting loose there uh, in our life. And so, we've seen a few circumstances here of what might cause us as humans to weep. Again, sometimes we bring it on ourselves. Sometimes it's a healthy reaction to what life brings us. Now let's go back to find Jesus here weeping. Go back to John and chapter 11. So here we find not just any human, uh, but the, uh, uh, the Son of God sent to take human form, and He's crying. He's weeping. We find Jesus here in, in chapter 11, and Jesus was friends with Lazarus and, and his family. Jesus cared for Lazarus. He cared for these two ladies, his sisters, uh, and when he heard the news that Lazarus was dead, he was moved to cry. But he wasn't moved to cry because he didn't already know that Lazarus had died or uh, because of the fact that Lazarus was dead. He was moved to cry because of how it affected those around him. Look back, uh, go back a couple verses here to verse 33 on down into 35. Uh, look at verse yeah, 33. It says, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, this is a sister, Mary, he says, the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and he said, Where have ye laid him? And they said unto the Lord, or unto him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Again, this act of crying of our Lord shows us so many things about him. So many things that we can take and just hold on to and use. And if we understand uh, the truth of our Lord and what this Him crying means to us, it helps us so much throughout our, our daily life. So let's look at a few of those. The first we mentioned in the introduction, Jesus weeping shows us the love of Jesus. The fact that He wept at the death of His friend shows that death, or the death of His friend shows the depth of His love. Again, it's a reminder that Jesus loves us. Go to verse 1, 2, and 3 of John chapter 11. It says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Jesus loved these two women. He loved their brother, this man Lazarus. Mary was, uh, th that is mentioned here, was the one that, would use her hair and the expensive ointment to wash Jesus' feet. You'll see that in John in chapter 12. And of course, it's easy then to see why anyone would love these three people. Look at how they admired and loved Jesus. They, we saw, see in verse 3, they reached out to Him in their time of need. And then they trusted Jesus uh, that He could help Lazarus even in life or in death. Notice verse 20. Uh, on down a few verses. Verse 20 says, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Be easy as a human to love these two ladies and this man. Uh, this is a, these are a dedicated people. They clearly loved Jesus. They trusted in Jesus. And so Jesus, of course, in turn, loves them. But Jesus shows His love very differently than we might expect Him to show His love. Of course, He shows His love in, in, in a few different ways. But one in particular here, uh, as an example, that He shows Lazarus and these two ladies, is that He deferred in coming to them. 
He loves them, therefore he deferred in coming to them. It's pretty counterintuitive to think that way. One would think that Jesus, again humanly speaking, that Jesus would, would rush to Lazarus as soon as he heard the news of his sickness even uh, in this. And then, of course, he, he delays. And there's at least two reasons that we can find or we can think about of why Jesus would delay. Look at verse 4 for the first one. It says, And when Jesus heard that, of course, that Lazarus was sick, it says, He said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Jesus shows His love and delays, number one, so that He might try them. So again, counterintuitive to think this way as well. Why would Jesus, how is Jesus showing love to us by trying us, by testing us? It doesn't make sense, and again, to the, to the human brain unless we uh, see what Jesus is getting at here. Jesus wants us to grow in love for Him. And so He wants us to learn more and more about His power and His love for us. Go to James chapter 1. You know where I'm headed here. So for us to grow in our love for Him, returning that love that He has for us, we have to go through some tests, some trials in our life. And tests improve us. Tests make us better. Uh, I was talking to my oldest daughter yesterday about uh, practice makes us better. And we have to practice to do better in games or whatever it might be. It's the same thing here. Tests are practice for something more. We get better in our life when we, and if we think in terms of our love for Jesus, when that love is tested, it becomes stronger and stronger for Him. Notice here, James chapter 1, you know it. It says in verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect worth, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. We have to go through trials. We have to be tested. And when we are tested, we, uh, we start to, if we, if we come through those tests in the right way, we start to grow in our life, in our love for uh, our, our Lord and Savior. So, God loves us. Jesus loves us. So, He tries us. He tests us. Number two, He also shows His love to Lazarus here, uh, to the sisters. He shows His love by designing this scene to do something extraordinary for them. He delays so that Lazarus would die, so that they would bury him before he came. So by deferring for so long, he now creates an opportunity to do more for Lazarus and his two sisters than any other. It's one of the most uh, amazing miracles that Jesus performs here, and we'll see it here in just a bit uh, in this. And so while it looks like he's let them down, and, we, and if they aren't careful, and we don't really see this necessarily, but they might think, well, Jesus, why, why didn't you come here? Why didn't you help him when he, was, when he was sick? It looks like he might have let them down, but in fact, he's going to do more for them than he does for uh, most other uh, in, this, in this capacity uh, in this. And so he shows his love in very counterintuitive ways, but that's still love that Jesus shows us. God, is, uh, he has gracious intentions even when he delays. He has gracious intentions even when he doesn't answer a prayer immediately. Even when He doesn't uh, give us what we want uh, and sometimes even delays what we need, He has gracious intentions in this. Just because Jesus didn't rush to them, uh, His friends were not out of His thoughts. And I have it marked here. Isaiah 55, 8 tells us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. So I've said it's counterintuitive multiple times. Uh, well, our thoughts are not His thoughts. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And so that would make, mean it's counterintuitive to our thoughts. We do well to remember that our thoughts are not His thoughts. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And Jesus often shows His love differently than what we would expect, but we must never doubt that love that He has for you and I. Then we see uh, another, uh, another uh, uh, something else that shows uh, that Jesus loves us, or excuse me, something else that is shown by His weeping is the compassion and humanity that Jesus has for you and I. Look at verse 33 in chapter 11 here. It says, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Again, his tears show us that he, is a, he has compassion, and it shows his humanity. 
It shows us He is not a distant God. He is a God uh, that is deeply touched by our sorrows, deeply touched by our griefs. He is a God who understands and empathizes with the human condition. So Jesus, in verse 33, He sees the griefs, of his, the griefs that His friends are going through, and He groaned and was troubled. Of course, those that truly love their friends are going to share in their joys and in their griefs, aren't they? They're going to hurt when they hurt. They're going to uh, have joy when they have joy. Friendship is just that, a communication of affections. Uh, and Jesus here was clearly friends with Lazarus and his two sisters. You see that groaning in spirit in verse 33. It's an expression of his feeling. A, he's feeling a sense of the state of the human uh, of, of the human life here. The power of death certainly creates such a feeling in us, doesn't it? That groaning in spirit. Uh, go to Hebrews in chapter 4. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4 should already have you turning there. And just, just uh, the first part of, of verse 15. The humanity of our Lord. Chapter, 5, or chapter 4 of Hebrews verse 15. Again, just the first part. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Christ was inwardly and sincerely affected by what His friends were going through. Groaned in the Spirit. Then look at verse 34, back in, in John 11. It says, And said, Where have you laid Him? And they said unto Him, Lord, come and see. Here's some more compassion. He asked the question. Jesus knows the answer. But he asked the question, Where is He? He shows the people he was truly concerned. He wanted to know. He wanted them to know he was concerned with where Lazarus was. And then in 35, Jesus wept. Again, this short verse gives us so much. Jesus truly was man. Jesus was susceptible to joy and to grief. He gives proof of his humanity here by shedding tears because he shows he could weep, that he physically could shed a tear, and he shows he would weep. That he was emotionally connected to man. And we won't go there, but Isaiah 53 3 tells us that our Messiah is acquainted with grief. He is very well aware of what you and I are going through. Compassion and humanity of our Lord. He felt emotions just like you and I as he walked this earth. He, uh, our God became human. And so we don't need to doubt does God know the pain I'm going through? Does God know? Uh, the, the, the suffering that I'm going through, yes, God very much knows. The suffering, the pain, the emotions that you and I go to, through on a day-to-day -day basis. Number three, we see the power of Jesus. Despite Jesus' sorrow here, he is going to, he, He's not going to stop at weeping. He goes on again to perform one of the most extraordinary miracles that we see Him perform while He walked this earth, the resurrection of Lazarus, it shows us that He has the power to turn our sorrows into joy, to turn our mourning into happiness. Look at verse 38 on down a little bit. Therefore, Jesus in 38, Jesus therefore again groaning in Himself, coming to the grave, it was a cave and stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Say I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the, de the, the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I know or knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And 43. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he, was, and he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, Loose him and let him go. Going back to verse 38, you see Jesus groans on his way to the grave. And maybe it's because of his friend's grief here. Maybe it's because of the unbelief that is shown by the people around him. You'll see that in verse 37. But Jesus doesn't complain about what's going on around him. He doesn't feel sorry for himself. He takes action and he orders the stone to be removed so that they all could see this dead body that's <clears> laying there, that's stinking, that's already rotting. He, he, he is setting the scene here. And then in verse 40, notice the reassurance that he gives Martha. Even, even in, in maybe if, if she had a moment of doubt, he's giving her reassurance. He says, Say thou not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory 
of God. How patient our Lord is with us. How patient He is with us as we sometimes cry when we don't need to cry or we shouldn't be crying or we don't deserve even uh, to feel that emotion because we brought that on ourselves. Sometimes uh, it's simply we are, we are hurt and we are sorrowful and grieving and how patient He is with you and I. And so after a prayer uh, to God, Jesus says this again in verse 43, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus, He could have raised Lazarus with a silent exertion of power. He could have just uh, thought it. And boom, Lazarus uh, raises up in this. But he did it by a call, and he did it by a loud call. He says, it says he cried with a loud voice. This call represented the significance of the power in raising the dead. The significance of what was going on. Jesus wasn't just healing a sick person. He wasn't just ridding someone of a demon. He was calling back a soul into the body. He was awakening the sleeping. And so again, this is one of the most extraordinary miracles that we see him uh, performing in this. This call was short, but it was mighty. Anyone can say it. Anyone could, could say, uh, Lazarus, come forth. But we see what happens in verse 44. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot, with grave clothes. Power went along with the word of Jesus Christ to reunite the soul and the body of Lazarus. And then Lazarus, he comes forth. Jesus' words, His actions, His feelings, they're more powerful than any force that we may come upon in, in the world. Matthew 28, 18 t- talks about all power is given unto Him. And then, of course, we can partake in that power uh, if we allow God to work in our life. And so we have a God that weeps with us, but He can turn around and show us the power beyond our human imagination. And then finally, we see in Jesus' tears some hope that we are given through those tears. Jesus' weeping gives us hope. It shows us it's okay to grieve. It, uh, it's okay for us to feel pain, for, to feel sorry, to feel sad. But with Jesus, those feelings are only temporary. What a reminder it is to us that Jesus promises us a future where every tear will, will be wiped away. Lazarus' resurrection here is a good example of this hope. Death is not the end. Now, this is an extraordinary circumstance here. Uh, and, and the scene here, we can't necessarily count on something like this happening, but we can know death is not the end. We may not be resurrected. We may not live in the same body uh, like we see here. But when we die here as safe Christians, we are present with the Lord. Jesus showed His friends who He loved. We saw that. He showed His friends mercy in raising this man from human death. Go to Revelations in chapter Revelation chapter 7. That'll be the last spot we go. He showed mercy to his friends here, who he loved. Mercy in raising this man from human death. But he also showed mercy to the whole world when he died on the cross that you and I might have everlasting life. And we get to live that life in a perfect place called heaven. Notice the description here in Revelation 7. Look at verse 17. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. In closing, our Savior weeps. Thank God that our Savior weeps. Our Savior loves us. He shows compassion for for us. He shares in our pain and our sorrow. But Jesus has the ability and the willingness to do more than just weep with us. He has the ability to show us the power to heal us. And no, He may not heal us from something in this life, but for eternity, we get to spend our, our, etern- our we get to spend eternity in a place where He shall wipe away all tears. What a God that we serve. What a God we have. The hope that we have in Jesus because He gave His life mercifully uh, gave us life to, so that we could mercifully spend an eternity with Him where there are no more tears. I'll end it there. Let's, let's stand. Have a word of prayer as we get ready for the song of invitation. Lord, coming to this morning, Lord, again, just thankful to be in Your house. God, thankful for the crowd that we have here this morning. Thankful for this, this privilege that we have to be in Your house and to sing about You and worship You, to... Lord, just go through Your Word. and God, I just pray we've done You justice here this morning, God. And again, just thankful for the time that we've had here together. 
Lord, I pray that if there's anyone out here this morning that knows you not as their Savior, that maybe uh, can't count on having their tears wiped away for eternity, I pray, Lord, that today, that this morning, uh, that when we sing this song of invitation, they'll take that step of faith out to the aisle, come down to this old-fashioned altar, they'll kneel, and Lord, we'll lead them in the path they need for that salvation so they can know that, God, that you'll wipe away their tears, God. We just thank you so much for the blessings you've given us, God. Continue to bless and strengthen this church, God. Just watch over each and every one of us. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. 375. Amen. 375, just as I am. Thank you. all this in thy blessed name, for this is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen.